Hi everyone, I hope you guys are doing really well. Welcome back to my channel where I try to answer some of your random questions, things you're wondering and you don't know. Today I'm going to answer the question, how does Joburg get its water? Most cities are found on the banks of large rivers, but not Joburg. In fact, in all of Gauteng, which has over 17 million people, there's no big source of water, no massive river, no large lake or dam. I mean, there's like small dams, but no massive dam. The population density in Gauteng is more than any other section of our country, yet we have no water. Our rainfall is sporadic and seasonal. South Africa as a whole is in the top 30 water-scarce nations on earth. So how does Joburg get its water? I'll give you the quick answer first. We don't have any water. And what I mean by that is Joburg has to get its water from elsewhere because we literally don't have any water. It's both pumped and brought down in rivers and canals and a collection of dams all the way from the Lesotho Highlands mountains, as well as the Drakensberg via the Tugela River. And it's a very complex system. It is collected in dams and travels along rivers, which eventually lead to the Val Dam, which is south of Johannesburg. It then travels in canals and pipelines to two treatment plants in Ferienchen, if you say it like that, Ferienchen. It's a difficult word to say, Ferienchen. And then it's pumped by randwater, mostly uphill, uh, in about 3,000 kilometers of pipes to Joburg, Pretoria, and municipalities surrounding us, Gauteng, everywhere. It even goes all the way to Rustenburg, so that's impressive. These municipalities are then in charge of distributing water to various homes, businesses, and schools, and that's how you get water in your tap. Now stick around till the end to find out if Joburg is running out of water. For the long answer, we're gonna have to take a quick look into the history of Johannesburg. Joburg is really a city that shouldn't be here. Uh, when gold was discovered in 1886, a small mining camp was born. A lot of other mining camps have been formed and no city was made. So that's what's fascinating about Joburg. Joburg just seemed to attract crowds. Now the problem is crowds need to drink water and they need to cook and they need to shower. So then they formed the Waterworks Commission, right? Their goal was to try find water for all these miners and people that have come to Joburg to try their luck in getting gold, right? So they initially began pumping water from various springs and wells. First from a uh, Fordsburg Spreit, I'm not good with Afrikaans, Fordsburg Spreit and Natal Spreit, then from a spring in Parktown, followed by a spring in Doornfontein. And obviously the more people that came, the more they needed water and these springs and wells weren't enough to supply water for the whole of Joburg. But in 1896, a clever man, Dr. Draper, discovered Zierdebekom, which is a massive underground well of water. So it's like this massive cavern underground. And so they started using that water to supply water to the whole of Joburg. It's like one big well. The interesting thing is that well still has water today, but the problem is it can't keep up with the amount of water that's needed to supply the whole of Joburg. So they had to think of another plan. So Joburg needed more water. In 1903, the Waterworks Commission established Rand Water, which is still the company that supplies water today. Rand Water's goal is to provide Joburg with safe and clean drinking water. Rand Water established the Vaal River Barrage in 1923. And then after that, the Vaal Dam they built in 1938 to try provide water for everyone. And that worked for a while until that started running low. The Vaal Dam is in an area that receives around 600 millimeters of rainfall per annum in 38,000 square kilometers. But interestingly, it loses two or three times that amount due to natural evaporation off the surface because it's quite shallow. Uh, this means that more water is lost to evaporation off the surface for 11 months of the year than flows in under natural conditions. To sustain the rapidly growing metropolitan that was Joburg and Pretoria and surrounds the smart people of the day in the 60s and 70s, scientists, engineers, etc., decided, guys, the Vaal River system is not going to be enough to supply Joburg going forward in the future. We need to make a plan. So that's when they decided to come up with two transfer schemes. They initially thought of the first one is the Tugela Val transfer scheme. The second one is the Lesotho Highlands water project. So I'm going to quickly explain the two transfer systems because it's important to how the water that we drink today comes to us. It's quite hectic. So stick with me. It's a little bit complicated, but just let's go for it. The first transfer scheme is the Tugela Val transfer scheme, which diverts water from Drakensberg and KwaZulu Natal. Now this is a really complex engineering masterpiece involving four dams and massive pump stations 
powered by electricity from the ESCOM grid, this scheme is pretty cool as it works to provide additional water to the Val Dam, but it can also be used to power a turbine which adds some more supply to the ESCOM grid. So it's got like a two for one task where it supplies water to us in Joburg, but also it can supply power to the ESCOM grid in times of need. Pretty cool. The biggest dam in that system is the Stackfontein Dam, which is gorgeous by the way. I've been there, it's stunning. It's like this massive, basically looks like an ocean because it's really, really big. Um, but that dam provides multi-year storage. So it can provide storage for years to come because it's massive. And the cool thing is it has a low loss of evaporation. Now remember Vol evaporates a lot. The Stackfontein Dam has a low loss of evaporation. So its level is even more important than the level of the Vol Dam. But if there's no electricity, then there is no water supply from the Tugela because basically it has to be pumped water from the bottom of the Drakensberg to the top. So they're using an electric pump to do that. And if there's load shedding and problems and if there's no power, that supply can be halted. So a bit iffy as well. I'll quickly explain how the system works. The scheme starts from water at the Tugela Falls, which comes at Montessources in the Drakensberg, right? A certain amount of water from that river is then transferred via canals, pipelines and dams into the Vaal River system. I'm going to quickly rapid fire through the dams. The Tugela River flows into the Woodstock Dam and then into the Drill Barrage further downstream and then it's pumped into the Kilburn Dam, right? Water from the Kilburn Dam is then pumped underground over the Drakensberg, which is over 500 meters uphill, and then into the Driekloof Dam. Cool thing about the Driekloof Dam is that it's a dam within a dam. So it's actually within Stackfontein Dam, which is very cool. I'll show you, there'll be a photo here. This section of the scheme is used to generate electricity as a hydroelectric power station because it can go in reverse. So it can either pump uphill or it can pump downhill. And when it's going downhill, it generates hydroelectricity. So at peak periods when ESCOM needs lots of power, morning and evening, uh, when electricity is needed, water is dropped from the Driekloof Dam all the way down through the underground tunnels and through hydroelectric turbines, which create electricity as it goes into the Kilburn Dam. So in quiet periods of time when ESCOM doesn't need power, which probably not that much because ESCOM always needs power. But anyway, water is then pumped back from the Kilburn Dam into the Dukluof Dam up that hill. And that water goes into the Stagfontein Dam with the Weir system. And that water then goes into the Nivayar Spreit, hopefully I said that right, which is a river, which then flows to the Volker River, which then flows into the Val Dam. So that's how we get water from the Tugela Val water system. Very smart, very fancy masterpiece in engineering. The next stage in providing water for Joburg and the Greater Gauteng region as a whole was the development of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which began in 1986. This project is also, it's an amazing feat of engineering. This system feeds water by gravity with the aid of a couple of tunnels, dams, um, and helps to create a stable supply of water in Joburg. This is actually where we get the majority of our water in Joburg from Lesotho, Lesotho Highlands. This part of the project is actually pretty cool because when I was, I think about five or so, I went to Lesotho and I actually got to go into the wall of the Kati Dam and like, explore. It was so cool. Got on a tour, got to see the tunnels and it was really cool. So this subject actually really, really fascinates me because I've actually been there and I've seen the wall and I've seen the dam and it's, it's massive. It's really fascinating. The project first diverts water from the orange slash Senku, hopefully I said that right, Senku River into two big dams. The main one is the Katsi and as well as the Mahali Dam, which was part of phase 1B. So Mahali feeds into the Katsi and then water from the Katsi is drawn into a tunnel by an intake tower, which is close to the dam wall. The water then travels through an underground pipe, 44.75 kilometers long through the Muela hydroelectric power station and into the Muela dam. Cool thing about Muela is that provides power for Lesotho. So it's kind of like a byproduct. We get water, they get power. Pretty cool. The water from the Muela dam then travels along a 33.27 kilometer underground pipeline and finally flows into the Ash River near Clarence in South Africa. So it goes, travels the international boundary into Clarence. The Ash River then flows into the Salt Spray Dam. Thereafter, the water flows into the Libe I must read this properly because Liebenbach Flay River, then into the Wilke River, and then again into the Val Dam. So that's how we get our water, most of our water. Let me quickly go through the other phases that are still to come. Phase two of this project includes building a further three dams in Lesotho, namely Polihali Dam, the Taung Dam, and the Labello Dam, with underground pipelines feeding into the existing dams, mostly Katsi as well. 
The Lesotho Highlands Water Project supplies about 30 cubic meters per second, which is a lot of water coming to South Africa. South Africa then pays Lesotho about $35 million per year. I'm pretty sure that amount is higher as these stats are a bit old. So that's a lot of money that South Africa is paying Lesotho for this water. The project has had an important impact to Lesotho because it's helped them to build infrastructure, roads, paving, all sorts of things. And I think that's kind of cool. There is also the side effect that it's displaced communities and obviously changed the ecosystem. So I don't know, 50-50 we're taking from them, which is kind of bad. We are giving back a bit. I don't know if the pros way outweigh the cons, but that's how Joba gets its water. There will also be a phase three and four of that whole Lesotho Highlands water project, which involves the construction of the Tsolike Dam at the confluence of Tsolike and Senku rivers, as well as the Ntohai Dam, nearly 25 miles downstream from the Tsolike Dam. So the last element that makes all this work that for us to be able to get water is RAND water. They're kind of like the bulk supply of water, clean, purified drinking water to Gauteng. So their water complies with the requirements of South African standard of drinking water, which is SANS 241 and the World Health Organization's guidelines. So the water coming from the Val Dam is purified at Swartkopis and Zekerbosch pumping stations. Stay with me, it's going to be fast for a few seconds, where it is screened, coagulated and flocked, sedimented and then the sludge is disposed. Then they carbonated, they filtrated and then they chlorinated. So that's the whole process of filtration to get our water from raw water to purified drinking water and our water is actually it's nice. I mean, I love our water. It's great. After that, the purified water is then pumped underground pipes from the purification stations via a series of pump stations to closed reservoirs and then distributed via 3,000 kilometers of pipes, a lot of pipes. And these pipes are like big. Uh, they're about between 1.5 and 2 point something meters. So I could like fit inside the pipe. Pretty cool. Those pipes then lead to reservoirs and then from there, municipalities take water from those reservoirs to their local reservoirs where it's then distributed to your homes. So that's how we get the water. It's very complicated and it shows you how willing people are to make things work. My final thoughts are, I've been reading articles and people are a bit worried, will the water run out in Joburg? So from the purification stations in Ferienachem to Joburg, Chwani, etc., other parts of Gauteng, the water needs to be pumped up because it's actually going uphill to get to Joburg. And pumps need electricity. So uh, you can see where I'm going. If we don't have ESCOM and they're not supplying power, then it's possible that we lose power for those pumps. Even the local reservoirs need pumps sometimes to pump to different reservoirs, etc. And if ESCOM is there and there's low jetting, there's no power, then sometimes there's disruptions to water, which can be a concern. But it's not that we don't have water supply, it's that we don't have a way to transport that water during load shedding. So if they can fix load shedding, then we still have water. In addition to load shedding, since about 1994, the maintenance of provincial and city infrastructure has declined a bit, and it's now a little bit non-existent in some parts. So aging infrastructure is in need of a lot of maintenance. And obviously if, if you're dealing with pipes that are not maintained, there'll be bound to be leaks, problems, and you're wasting a lot of water. Another issue that could be affecting our water supply is vandalism, often due to load shedding because then there's no power, so vandals and thieves, criminals, can then come in while there's no power and take electronic infrastructure that's used to pump. So there's been an increase of this type of crime due to load shedding, and when there, which then prolongs the time it takes to get water pumps back online, which means there's less water supply and that's a problem. So vandalism is also a problem, also probably mostly caused by load shedding, but there's criminals out there that are trying to feed on this opportunity. Another aspect that we need to look at is our water usage, unfortunately. The average world consumption of water per day is 173 liters per person, whereas the average for South Africa as a whole is 233 liters, which is already a lot more. But listen, Gauteng's daily average is 300 liters a day. So we're using like almost double what the average world population is using and we're a water scarce country. So that doesn't make sense. So we're using too much water. Three reasons. Number one, bad infrastructure. There's leaks, there's pipes and lack of maintenance. There's leaks in the pipes and a lack of maintenance. Number two, informal settlements and illegal connections where people have tried to hook to the water and they're not paying. Um, number three is that we're simply using too much. 
so we need to do better. Did you know of the water that Rand Water supplies, about 45% of it is lost to non-revenue water. So that's water that nobody's paid for, which means it's either illegal connections, it's lost through leaks and stuff. So that's almost half of our water. It's not actually being used by people that are paying for it, which is a bit of a concern. Temporarily, it is possible to run out of water as most of the water needs to be pumped. So if there's problems, then sometimes we could lose water for a bit. In some areas, the water pressure is a bit low because of that. Luckily, at the big infrastructures that Randwater has, such as their purification plants, they're actually called the national key point, which means they don't get load shedding. So they're actually exempt from load shedding and they can be purifying water the whole time, which is good. So the question is, is there enough water for population growth going forward? And my answer is yes, especially if you consider the future plans of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, there actually is enough water, but it, it would be great if people could consider being considerate so that we can have water for generations to come. Also, as long as South Africa stays friends with Lesotho, because if Lesotho had some issue and cut our supply of water, that'd be a big problem because we don't have that much water. So please, Lesotho, love us. We love you. But just the final thing that I read in the last few days, Randwater is actually planning to build 12 new reservoirs at a cost of 28 billion Rand in the next five years to make sure Gauteng has enough water for its residents up to 2028. So at least they're hopefully thinking ahead. And there are currently 60 reservoirs, so they will try to increase that to 72 reservoirs. So I think that's a good thing and hopefully they continue to make progress in the future to make plans for us. So that's how we get water and every drop counts. And every drop that we get is here thanks to people who were smart in the past and currently who are thinking ahead, who have thought ahead to make plans to think of these creative and amazing engineering feats. We've got to thank the engineers who thought up ways to move water up mountains, down mountains, through tunnels, and it's really quite impressive. These people allow Joburg to exist as one of the only cities that are located not next to a river, an ocean, a lake, a dam, anything like that. And surprisingly, a city with one of the biggest artificial forests in the world. All of that with no water. So it's pretty oppressive. Hopefully we have people who will continue to look to the future to provide water for Joburg for generations to come. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Let me know if you have any random things you want to know about, pop them in the comment thingies below, and then maybe I'll answer your question in the next video. Peace.